Hi everyone, Alan Schimmel, DevOps.com, DevOps TV, and we're here in London for DevOps Enterprise Summit UK 2018. Uh, in this segment, we have two gentlemen from uh, two of the leading financial institutions in the world. To my extreme right, uh, we have Sean Norris of Standard Charter Bank. Sean's based in Singapore, so he's come a little bit of a way here. Yeah, good morning. Well, good morning and welcome. And to my immediate right, we have Nick Funnel Funnel of Barclays. Morning. All right, so I got the bank name right, but <laughs> forgot the last name. It's typical. But gentlemen, whether you know, as long as we don't call you late for dinner, all is good. We're here today to you both presented at uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit, and um, one of the themes of this year's uh, speaker uh, committee, you know, selection criteria was what we're calling next-gen ops, or new ops, some folks are calling it. And really what it is, it's a recognition that, for many people, the DevOps transformation story was, was very dev-focused. Right? It was dev-led, dev-focused. But there's been a corresponding earthquake change in the ops world as well. And, and it's both a shifting left of ops, as well as just a new way of looking at ops as the mission has changed, perhaps. So let's start with that. Has the ops mission fundamentally changed in the, in the age of DevOps? Sean, would you want to go first? I think it changed some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, really, you know, I've been telling people for the last three or four years that if you've got system administrator in your job title, you'd be best to think about how your career is going to, you know, where it's going to go next, because you're probably going to have to go learn some new skills. It's probably going to need to involve coding. Right. And uh, ops is definitely changing. Everything's software defined now, or at least it will be soon. You know, large enterprises like ours, we aspire to have everything software defined. We're not there yet, but we can see it at the end of the tunnel. That, that's a huge thing, right? I mean, this whole software defined networking, software defined infrastructure, software as code, etc. But Nick, you know, Barclays is a bank I think many in the DevOps world are familiar with because some of the great kind of groundbreaking work that, you know, the team of Barclays has done. But has ops fundamentally changed there as well? I think it's changing. I mm -hmm. think is I mean, you know, it's, it's a big organization. We have, I think, about 30,000. 80,000 employees and 30,000 IT people. Absolutely, very good. <laughs> <laughs> you got this written down there, have you? No, no. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, you still lose that MMF. Um, but yeah, so you've got a lot of IT, a lot of systems there. Um, you know, the entire ops community is not going to change from one thing to another. They're all very, very different. So where we're working within the cloud space, yes, absolutely, we're bringing ops a lot closer to us. They're taking on a lot more of the sort of the coding, you know, pipeline automation. But then you still also have much more traditional ops teams, you know, some offshore, some yeah, you know, all over the place, running different systems. Mm -hmm. And maybe their role won't change much. So I think there's something for everybody there. There is. Because, I, you know, fundamentally, I think nothing scares people more than change, right? And, and it's not just IT or ops or anything. I think people are, as much as we may vote for politicians who promise change and never deliver, uh, we, we are fundamentally afraid of change in our workplace, right? Because we, we like getting a paycheck. Most of us need a paycheck, need our paycheck to support our families. And when we when the and the prospect of change is unsettling, right? Sean, you you hit it when you said, "Hey, if you're not learning a little code, you know, you may have a you may have a pivot ahead of you." Um, but let's talk specifically. What what kind of technologies and and processes you think are you know putting the squeeze on are the the, the forces at play here? So I'd been at Standard Chartered a fairly short time. When I joined uh, early last year, uh, we were having some stability challenges. You know, things weren't running uh, as well as we liked all of the time. And one of the CIOs that I worked for asked me to go do a review of what things were causing instability. We went through and it was some fairly obvious things, but we found that things like code deployments being done manually and DR failovers being done manually, and even sometimes some HA setups being done manually. Hmm. Those, those things 
they failed at a higher rate than things that were automated. So one of the real tactical things we did is we start, started scripting this stuff. So we, we took Rundeck, um, which we really like, mm -hmm. and we started doing some really tactical things like saying, hey, if you're going to do a DR failover, rather than have a playbook that's 14 pages long in a Word document, that if, if you do it enough times, you're going to get it wrong, well, why don't we just script that up? And so there's other tools that are good as well. We picked Rundeck. It, it works pretty well for us. But you know, this year so far, we've run 13,000 jobs in Rundeck. Wow. And when you think of the compliance overhead of just using production IDs in a banking environment, that saves us enormous time and gives us huge efficiencies. So we're really early in that journey, but that's one of the things we've been doing to help kind of shift the way we're doing ops. So it, it's become sort of a, a little bit of infrastructure as code in, in terms of you know, running these scripts and autom the automation aspect of it, not only does it speed it up, but it's, it, it, it makes it, uh, it increases the quality, right? Because you don't have human error. Exactly. Fair enough? Yeah. If, if you can standardize, and even if you're dealing with legacy type equipment, and I, I would include things like, you know, VMs in, mm -hmm. as legacy equipment today when everything's heading towards Docker and containers yeah. and Kubernetes, even if you don't have the, the new sexy hardware or you know, software-defined infrastructure, you still want to have a consistent automated approach to how you handle it. And that's, that's what we're kind of doing first, to almost bias enough stability to transition to the new, uh, you know, more modern infrastructure stack. Nick, what about Barclays? Would, similar to Sean? I think so. I think for me, I mean, you know, everybody talks about well, what is DevOps. For me, it, it's a cultural thing, but the tooling is an enable, enabler for the, for the culture, if you like. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we, when we first started, you know, building, you know, enabling AWS at, at Barclays, you know, we, we, you know, we can do deployment pipelines, you know, automated all the way through. But we built it to our test environments, and then we were, we were very pleased with that. But there was definitely a feeling that we needed a manual process to give this thing to ops for them to deploy. And we really had to sort of challenge it hard and go, well, actually, why do we need to do that? We've now got the tooling. So culturally and process-wise and sort of mindset-wise, we had to think, well, actually, this is much more reliable, and we can still have the separation of concerns that we need. It's still ops essentially pressing the button. Um, so, and I think there's, there's a level of trust as well. I, mean, I think the traditional relationship is always very adversarial. Um, you know, dev optimizing for change, ops optimizing for stability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's dev trying to get ops to accept a thing that they won't accept. Whereas actually by bringing them closer and them understanding the process and trusting the pipeline, they're much happier to say, well, yeah, let's just do this. It's easier for us. It's easier for you. Everybody wins. Sure. You know, I'm reminded of my own experience in the cybersecurity space. Um, I was the company I had co-founded was where we went from intrusion detection to intrusion prevention, which was not just identifying potential intrusions, but actually automated the blocking of them, right? Proactively blocking traffic and stuff. And I was amazed because I so underestimated the reluctance of, of security admins then, but they're op back in those days, most security folks were ops people. You didn't have a, the dedicated security stuff you have there. And, but their reluctance to allow you know, traffic to be blocked in an automated manner, even though it was, I'm not saying bleeding edge, I'm talking about run-of-the-mill nonsense, right? Code red, blaster kind of you know, worms back then. You know, why would it, who wouldn't want to just block that, right? Or do I really need a human to look at every single one of those alerts and decide, are we going to block that in the future? Um, do you think we get some of that? Is the is the is, is it just human nature? Do you think to kind of resist or? Well, is there a fear then of being automated out of a job? Is that? I think underlying it, that you're right. And Sean, I don't know if you feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, the the technology is interesting, but the human dynamics of large organizations are maybe even more interesting. That I describe it as a bit of an organizational conflict of interest. Whatever big enterprise you're in, uh, we've rewarded people for the past 20 or 30 years or more for having large organizations, having large teams, and mm -hmm. controlling large budgets. And that's 
that's how you move ahead in your career. And there's other ways. You can be that single unicorn, amazing technologist, you know, a James Hamilton mm -hmm. type person from yeah. Amazon. But those guys are, you know, one in a thousand, one in a million. But the rest of us kind of make our way up the corporate ladder by having larger and larger teams. And now we're asking those same people to say, throw away everything you learned about mm -hmm. how, to, how to get ahead in your career. And you're now going to have to deliver value by doing more with way less. And so if people aren't fully trusting of, of kind of the direction, they're going to passively block. I kind of describe it as like white blood cells. You know, they sit around doing nothing most of the time until foreign invaders come right. in. But then, boy, are they motivated to make sure you can't do what you want to do. Uh -huh. and so we, we see some of that in our organization, too. So, you know, it, it is human nature. So how do, Nick, how do we get people to trust the, the automation? How do we get them to trust the process? How do we make them fundamentally understand that, hey, by automating this stuff, it actually creates more opportunity for you over here? Or over, you know, doing something else that may be of higher value. I think the only thing you can do is, is show people really, and just show them, you know, small experiments. Do something simple like like we've done. Well, first of all, start to build a relationship of trust, and then show them that the results you get from that. Show them that actually this makes their life easier. And then they, you know, rather than spending a whole weekend with the system offline, you know, it's push button and, and in it goes. So. They're ultimately, yeah, they're then seeing that actually the life, the life is easier. You don't need, they don't need to trust you. It just is, you know. And then I suppose as soon as they start to see that maybe this thing is more reliable now and they don't have the problems deploying, again, it's, it's, it's sort of shown by example, I suppose, that you're building up trust that way just again and again. And, of course, you, you mustn't betray that trust. You mustn't, you know, you've got to behave with integrity and make sure that you keep using that process and you mm -hmm. don't try and slip something around the corner. Because as soon as that trust is broken, then... It's very hard to win yeah. back. So, you know, I, can I would describe your philosophy on this as the seeing is believing school of thought, right? If you like. Is they've got to kind of feel it, touch it, see it for themselves. And that, over time, builds their confidence into, you know, releasing their cold, stiff hands from the buttons, right? Well, ops here developers say things all the time. This will be absolutely <laughs> fine. Just to, we'll just fix it. They don't, and I don't blame them. I mean, I'm a developer, but that's where I come from. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not an ops person, and I, and I see it all the time. You know, oh, they're sure this will be fine. Like, no, it won't be fine. It wasn't fine last time. It wasn't, it wasn't fine, fine the time, before that, time. Yeah. Right. And, and what's interesting is you may have it work 99 times out of 100, but that 100th time when it doesn't work, you know, it takes on a life of its own, right? And it's, you remember that time it didn't work, right? And, uh, and, and you, you know, when you're talking about building trust, that it's so important to, to carry through, right? And to make, to make, to build that trust. It's so easy to, to lose that trust. You, you know, you can work so hard building trust over such a period of time and then lose it you know, almost in a heartbeat. And I don't think that people mind something going wrong as long as you've sort of followed the agreed, you, you've got that trust. You haven't betrayed the trust, just things right. happen sometimes. I mean, because as they say, stuff happens. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's anyone's fault. It doesn't mean that a process is wrong. It just sometimes stuff happens. And, and if we could understand why and correct it, there shouldn't be a loss of trust in there, you would hope. Well, I think no, no blame postmortems are a thing as well. You know, in terms of yep. when something goes wrong, you have a conversation. And I've, I've read this somewhere, you know, people talk about, yeah, everybody says at the start, we all did our best here with the information we had at the time. You know, and you don't throw anybody under a bus. You know, it's nobody's fault. It's a systemic failure. I mean, again, back to my security days, we, we had the same, Sean, I'm sure you've probably seen this, we had the same kind of thing. I've never seen a developer raise his hand and say, I want to develop insecure code, right? Or I want to, I, I hope my code's buggy. It, you know, everyone, I think, tries to do their best. I think, and, and that is again a fundamental trust in the organization that everyone's here with a common goal of doing good for the organization, and we do the best we can. It may not be perfect; there may be setbacks, but we, no one tries to do their worst, or no one, no one tries to do less than their best. Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. I, I've been in the banking industry a fairly short time. I spent most of my career in tech companies before that. Mm -hmm. And so I find there's a big difference from, you know, I talk to 
friends who work at Google, and as soon as you start working there, you can automatically see any line of source code in any project. It's, it's a very high trust environment. Right. Whereas banking, by nature, is a very low trust environment. If you have money in one of our accounts, you you kind of want you're not going to have it there long if you don't have confidence that we've got makers and right. checkers it's, and mm -hmm. lots of checks and balances. So we're, we're by nature a low trust environment and that bleeds into the technology too. So we don't, you know, one of the fundamentals is we never trust any single person to do something unattended or unchecked. And so you have to have maker, checker, and sometimes with bureaucracy you have maker, checker, checker, checker. But uh, that how do you, that, that's one of the challenges I'm still working on. I don't know the answer, but how do you drive a DevOps culture where people have that trust that they're gonna have the blameless post-mortem and they're not gonna be hung out to dry if they ran the wrong command, but also you know, maintain the structural integrity of the bank? That, yep. It's a big challenge for us in financial services specifically. You know, it's funny you bring that up because to me, one of the, um, I don't even know the right word, but you know, one of the interesting data points, because at DevOps.com, right, I'm looking across the whole DevOps market across the world, right? We look at different verticals, geographic areas, etc. And what was kind of paradoxical—that's the word I was looking for—paradoxical was such a high, you know, risk-adverse industry such as banking would be so well represented in the DevOps industry, which is kind of out there, right? But yet, they are. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'm telling you whether we're a DevOps Enterprise Summit or an IBM or CA or, or DevOps Days events, the banking and financial services industry leads the way. Leads the way, not follows, leads the way. How do you rectify Risk aversion, right, and trust being such an important part of the equation to leading the way in, in you know, DevOps and related kind of technologies. Well, I'll jump in here. I think it's time to kind of explode some myths in how we've done technology for the past 30 years that are still very commonly held that, you know, more change is more risky. And so the way to mitigate risky change is to go slower. It's actually to go faster. If you, if you talk to guys like Gary Groover, they'll yep. tell you that automated testing is really the pivot point that all this rests on. And you know, a lot of our testing today is still manual. And so even with the best DevOps pipeline in the world and amazing controls at every step, which we're working on, if you're still doing your testing manually, you've got this huge spot where people can you know, click the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. So if you get to automated testing and you can deploy multiple times a day, and you reduce the failures caused by change, well, you're going to get some of those outcomes that the DORA report and the state yeah. DevOps. That, that's why we're all in on, on this, is because we want those outcomes. It's just the, the heavy compliance in our industry makes it really tough to get there as, as compared to, say, a startup. Yeah, absolutely. Nick, what do you think? I mean, Barclays is, you know, yeah, I mean, I way I, out. I, I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, I think it's... Um, but also, I think the you know, organizations are so big, they're so lumpy. So, you know, we may be leading the way in some areas, but other areas are actually, they're sort of, they're getting on with their day job, if you like. Mm -hmm. They're sort of, you know, not, not, not all of the bank has time to, or the resources to, to innovate. So we're, we're bringing these ideas in and hopefully they will flow through. I think it's interesting picking up on testing. I think test automation is, is key. And I think, no doubt. Um, you know, we took one of the themes of my presentation, you know, it's not, and it's actually a theme I'm seeing in all the other presentations as well. It's not about the technology. That's relatively the easy bit. It's the culture. It's the bringing people together. And you know, by moving people to the left, so bring ops into the left, bring testing into the left. So testers are no longer doing all the testing. They're ensuring the testing is done. And with test automation, their job becomes very interesting because they are you know, making sure that the test automation is in place so you can move fast. And then they get to test the interesting stuff, the edge cases, the exploratory testing right at the end. And the same with security, Bring, you know, bringing everybody to the left, we're getting much stronger outcomes. Absolutely, and um, you know, interesting, you have to have a certain scale to be lumpy, right? Startups, to your point, Sean, right? It's hard for them to be lumpy, there's only one lump. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where, where a Barclays with 30,000 IT people or you know, a standard chartered bank, you, you, we sometimes have to remember that when we talk about Enterprise, 
organizations. Well, well, just on that, I think in a startup, you, you almost get DevOps for free because your ops go, your dev people, you're sitting there probably in one room. Maybe there's five, ten of you. So oftentimes and you're working it's the together. same guy. Right. Well, exactly, yeah. Right. Exactly. At least in the beginning until we can start taking some hats off, right? Yeah, and as we scale as a big organization, functions are created and then they're in different locations and you just go further like that. And yeah. you're thinking about your function, not the product or the service you're delivering. Yeah, and, and you know, to something we mentioned before, inherent in that trust equation is the understanding, or at least the belief, that we're all pulling in the same direction with the same goal. And Nick, when you start stretching out like that, and you silos start coming up, and you know, and, and, and you know, everyone has an agenda, and departments and you know, divisions have agendas. You start thinking, well, that ops guy doesn't have the same goal I do. <laughs> and dev and the security guy certainly doesn't he just likes to say no right and, and the testing guy he's scared to death of the automation because it's going to be the end of his career right and and so we have all of a sudden we're not all pulling in the right direction because we all have our own you know hey i've got a family to feed i've got kids to worry about and what's going to happen when they automate my job away and i'm just a button pusher um and that that's reality that's the reality that we live in in, in, in today's, you know. And, and by the way, not blaming DevOps, not blaming financial services, this fear of automation, right, is pervasive throughout the world in terms of, you know, what, what's tomorrow's jobs look like, right? Is AI going to replace us or some robot or machine learning or something? So, I mean, the... The times they are a changing, right? And and so we, it's manifesting itself to bring this all back now because we rambled a bit, but it manifests itself in this new age ops, right? So we only have a few moments left. I wanted to give us kind of bring it back home. What is what does new age ops look like three years from now, five years from now? What what's the ops role? Is it well, the, you know, Nick, I can guess you're going to say, well, there'll still be some folks doing the old stuff, and there'll be some folks doing different stuff. But is that is that what the future holds, either one of you? Um, yeah. I, 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 yeah. You don't need me here, do you? <laughs> you know no, I've heard, heard it now from you, but go ahead. <laughs> but, um, but I do think that our, our, our ops teams are becoming more, than, you know, the, it's kind of obvious, but development and operations are converging. So our operations people are becoming more highly skilled in the code. So I could see them running the deployment pipelines and owning, owning the deployment from dev all the way through. I also, I mean, I was challenged the other day, somebody in our organization you know, was talking to me about this and said, I think, you know, we feel that DevOps is a dev thing and the devs will just leave ops to it. And I think, well, the, the blend will change. So you'll have teams running products and features. Maybe they're doing less development change work but they're still, as an ops person, they're, they're still making changes in a, in a sort of code fashion, if that makes sense. Excellent. Sean, I'm going to give you the last word. I think if you look at a lot of the ops jobs today in a large traditional enterprise, and some of our ops jobs look this way, they're not actually great jobs. You're, you're doing the same stuff over and over again. It's kind of the digital equivalent of having to clean up leaves along the side of the road. It's just not a very exciting job. We know that because in our organizations and other ones I talk to, someone comes along and offers these people 2 or 3% more money and they leave. Mm -hmm. And so attrition rates are high. It, you know, employee satisfaction scores aren't quite where we want them to be. And we think there's a strong correlation between doing what people like Google and SRE community would call toil. Right. You know, kind of non-value added repetitive work that would be better done by a machine. So we want to transition away from that and people who are willing to get on board. And, you know, often we take people with computer science degrees and lots of educational background who have potential for way more. And then we put them in jobs like this that are not fulfilling, not long term satisfying. So I think the industry is heading towards almost, you know, think of think of giving people power tools instead of hand tools. Mm -hmm. if, if you can sit and work with automation all day and work with build pipelines and you know Ansible, Puppet Chef, whatever tools those are, rather than sitting and doing things by hand, kind of ticket driven, you're gonna be working doing three or four or five times more value add work, but not actually working any harder. And you're gonna spend your time solving hard problems rather than mundane, repetitive toil. So I think that's the optimistic story about where ops is headed. You know, there's going to be a few folks who say, hey, I'm not up for that journey, but mm -hmm. people I talk to are overwhelmingly keen to kind of make that shift. I, I agree. 
Well, guys, we're, we're about out of time. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure our listeners, viewers will enjoy it as well. Thank you both for presenting at DevOps Enterprise Summit this year. And uh, continued success at both Barclays and Standard Charter. Great? Okay. Thank you. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, DevOps TV. Have a great day.